Do you ever think about like, you could crash one day and kill yourself? There is risks with anything. I, I would say for me, like combat sports or something would be more dangerous to me than what I would do. Do you have to be a bit nuts to become a racing car driver? We're doing 120 foot gap jumps at 100 mile an hour in cars, which are not really designed to go that far in the air. So Excite, you believe, is going to be a billion dollar brand. That's the aim for us, yeah. We're gonna be, we wanna own the new topics space. My next podcast interview is with an athlete, Oliver Bennett. He's a rally racing car professional driver. We obviously speak about driving, racing, the ups and the downs, but we speak about this, Excite, an energy drink that he founded a few years ago. You enjoy this episode, be happy, never content, and make sure you're subscribing. Right, welcome back to the podcast, Steve Sally Study. I've got a wicked guest in front of me today, Oliver Bennett. You are a businessman, and you are also a racing car driver, which makes you pretty fucking cool. Yeah, no, it's unusual. We were saying, how do we, what do I say? And it, it is wearing many hats, really. I've got a few hats. As you said, business owner for a few different businesses, one here, Excellent Energy. And then I've raced all my life. Been a passion of mine, passion turned profession, really, which is nice um and that's sort of how i manage my life almost is what i do yeah good stuff before we talk about your career your businesses you know the ups and downs of what you do um you're from bristol yeah bristol. Home, home of banksy there's actually a um exhibition on at the moment and they're saying it's going to be his last ever one called cut and run over in glasgow um and the only reason why it's relevant is because we are here at woodbury house in mayfair so being a, probably a, a Banksy fan, living in his, his hometown, what do you think of, of the space and what do you think of some of the artists in there? I love it. I love the fact it's street art as well, similar as you said to, to Banksy, but it sounds like you've got some guys more original than that. But I, I love, the, Bristol is quite an arty city. It's got an art culture. There's graffiti everywhere, some good, some bad. And obviously you've got the Banksy stuff. So I, I've loved the seeing the culture of art change. And what I particularly like about art is the... You know, when they're just getting the expressions through, Branksy does it well, where he gets these these cue times in society, these moments of pivotal thought, and he's got the girl letting go of the balloon, all these different things. And uh, yeah, art, I mean, this is art. Branding's art, everything's art eventually, isn't it? It is, it is, it is. Okay, talking about yourself then. Um, I always think, do you know, like, when I, uh, before Instagram done this bloody thing about getting verified and stuff, I was all, like, when I first started my Instagram account and also my YouTube, I always wanted to get to certain levels and I'm still a mere, mere pup in it. Um, but there was always a thing about getting a blue tick and now you can actually get it paid, <laughs> paid for. So now my next thing is, I really want to get a Wikipedia page and you got your own Wikipedia page. Um, it's actually quite a cool little thing to have, I, th I think. Do, yeah, you, do yeah. you ever think about that? Like, you've got a Wikipedia page. Do you know, I didn't know I had one until you just said. Does it say, <laughs> <laughs> does it say good things? Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> it's Bit. probably racing highlights. Yeah, it, of course, of course. Yeah, nice. No, I mean, it's, like, it's these things, in it? Do you ever find your goals are forever changing? Always. Um, and it's that thing. I think I've lived a constant life of, I've probably got that attitude where, is, is it? I was going to say, is it a shame where nothing's enough, but you just keep striving for more? But I think it's a personality thing. You've you've spent enough time around successful people and people that've done a lot in their life, and I think there's a, just that determination to always do more, isn't there? And as soon as you've got the Wikipedia page, you want the next thing, and there you go. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, I, I mentioned just before we started, the only person I think I've ever interviewed in the racing type world is Felipe Nasa, and that was over Zoom. So I don't have a bundles amount, amount of experience or knowledge about, you know, racing, Formula One, MotoGP, et cetera, but I do enjoy it. And I have been to a few Formula One things and, 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 and a few other kind of racing infused events. Um, so let's start from the beginning. I know that you were motocross and then you transitioned over into to rallying. I've got down here that you had an accident that meant that you had to transition into driving cars rather, rather than racing motorbikes. Tell me a bit more about the accident. Yeah, no, for sure. Like, like you said, I raced motocross all my life. Two wheels, I just grew up. Um, you know, I was one of these kids, just wanted a motorbike when I was small. Um, and my parents supported me really in that, as much as my mother's dismay. And, uh, you know, I, I just got into racing. I was racing every weekend across the UK. But, yeah, unfortunately, probably late, later in, I was probably 17, 18, had a bad accident, actually on a push bike, not a motorbike, cracked my uh, skull in a few different places. 
Um, so I was told really shouldn't probably race bikes for much longer. So I sort of just phased out of it. I had a few friends that had bad accidents as, as well. Um, one friend broke his back racing, a race I was in. I thought, you know, I'm getting old. I was probably 18 at the time. I was like, now is probably the time to hang my boots up and try something else. And it, it was just a very random moment. A guy messaged me. I never really thought about doing rally. Um, you know, it just seemed a bit out of reach. The teams in cars are very expensive. If you wrap it around a tree, you know, you've lost your car. And I just thought, well, would I enjoy it? Is it something I could do? And locally, a guy put up for sale a Subaru Impreza, an old Group B car. It's one, for those who don't know, it's like the Subaru you'd see Colin McRae driving, but you make it yourself. Um, and it was for sale, and it wasn't all that much money at the time. I think it was 10, 12 grand for this whole car that came all ready to go, and you could just go and race it. So um, in my moment of wanting to get back into racing, I ended up buying this car and just finding a friend who could do the spotting or sort of co-driving for me, tell you where to go, navigate. And we just done it. We done 11 rallies. I've done my first rally in the Forest of Dean, where I'm from. And I, out of 180 cars, I came 18th or something, like third in class. I thought, well, I've got the hang of driving a car. Um, and I was used to the racing. And it just went from there, really, and almost snowboard, I guess, to where I'm at now, which is, is professionally racing. Yeah. So you're still currently racing? Currently racing, yeah. A new series called Nitro Rallycross, which is fully electric. So the cars are a thousand horsepower, do not 60 in 1.8 seconds. So they're absolutely crazy. I race in a team that I own um, and I race with Jensen Button and Chris Meek. They're the two co-drivers who drive the second car depending wow. on their timetables and stuff. So yeah, it's gone a whole new level really. And obviously EV is the, the future of mobility, the future of cars. Um, that's why we race electric cars because that's what the, the teams in the OEMs want to make and manufacture and sell. So yeah, it's been mm. a crazy journey really. It was a question that I put over to F Felipe when I when I actually interviewed him, which is, so my background is, as far as sports are concerned, is squash and, and racquetball, because my mum and dad and my uncles were all big big time squash players and, and stuff. Then also football, bit of football. Uh, Chrissy, my uncle, was a pro footballer playing for Chelsea, etc. And then I got into boxing, and I've had 16 fights. My last fight was last year, and I still... Uh, like to do the sparring haven't found time to compete yet just because I'm so busy anyway some of these sports I mentioned are quite accessible you know you can go down the, the park you know kick a football around um, you can kind of do pads in your in your back garden you know with boxing and tire boxing and that kind of stuff and maybe squash is a little bit more difficult because you've got to go to but you can at least hit a ball up against the wall I mean when you're trying to pursue that career of being a professional racing car driver or, or racing motorbikes is not something you can just quite easily go down the park and do um it's always kind of in my mind and correct me if i'm wrong but been known as you need money to get into it is that a misconception or is that a reality you need money to get into motor racing it depends which way you go with it really I, when i grew up racing motocross um a lot of families doing motocross in that type of racing don't have a lot of money um, and a lot of it is their whole family's wealth really you're tied up in these kids bikes and their vans that they go and race with on the weekend but it's a passion do you know what I mean um, and they're doing it for that reason so you can definitely race on passion and make it work I think at the professional end um, yeah there's there's definitely money is involved to make the teams run and, and you know make the racing work depending on what sort of series you're in it depends whether you could pay for a seat a lot of people would pay to drive um very few i would say get to the very very top now just based on talent which you're right is then excess accessibility and money i think so it was no different for me really when i came into it my family supported me through the motocross years um which was great and we could afford to do that as a family and go racing and then as it became more professional i sort of came to the obvious conclusion really i wasn't a pedigree racing driver in terms of i didn't have loads of history of racing and a huge pedigree to race so I'm, i wasn't going to be able to go to a team and say hey pick me pay me to do it i'm the best you're ever going to get um because i didn't have any track record at that time so i went around it a different way and saw an opportunity well could i start a business that could fund my my hobby and my lifestyle of racing and that's where the the energy drink business came from excite really and that was a way for me to get into racing which is what i loved through a, a branding product that I consumed a lot and saw a gap in the market for. So they sort of actually came together at the same time. I was about 18, 19 when I started Rally. And when I knew I wanted to do do that for the rest of my life um, and needed some funding to do it, I was probably 
2021 and that's when we founded Excite. So yeah, all, it sort of happened together really. It's a lovely drink and I definitely want to talk about more about that, that business and, and your, 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 your vision and, and how you're going to scale it and, and, and what, what is next and how you come up with the, the flavors more importantly. Um, being, so I had a very, very, very short uh, stint when I was uh, not racing motorbikes, but I, I had a couple of super bikes. I had a GSX-R, K2, nice. came off in 2005, split my kidney open. Oh shit, was on in the hospital, road. On the road. Yeah, I'm going horrible. through a big bike phase at the minute. Horrible. I've got like too many bikes. Yeah. <laughs> I could see on your Yeah, your I was Instagram. on a track day last night on my Ducati. Um, then I got a GSX-R, sorry, uh, R6, Yamaha R6, and um, just completely tuned it up with like quick, quick shift <laughs> nice. and digital da dash, etc. And then I took it to a track, and I realised a couple of things. I'm totally, totally, totally underappreciated how fit you need to be doing it. Yeah, it yeah. is so difficult. I remember hearing a guy who used to go in my school, and he said, "Oh yeah, it's just, you just race around the the track. It's it's easy." And when I'd done a few laps, the, the, the achiness in my, I mean, the tent, how tense my legs got was, was totally crazy. But also at the same time, I realized that these other people that were flying around this track, and some of them were a little, even a bit overweight, but they were phenomenal on, on, the, on this bike. I realized how nuts they are. Yeah, they yeah, are yeah. absolutely fearless, these people. And my question to you is, do you have to be a bit nuts to become a racing car driver? You do, I think, have to have something. And I've, I've always wondered this because, you know, in the racing, I do the Nitro Rallycross. If you see videos of it, we're doing 120 foot gap jumps at 100 mile an hour in cars, which are not really designed to go that far in the air, um, turn it into a plane for a few seconds. And the same with bikes. And yeah, like last night, flat out on a Ducati around Brands Hatch with limited talent. So the thing I think for me is <laughs> adrenaline is a funny sort of thing in your brain. And I think it takes people that are sort of elite at most, but I think it takes a lot to jack your brain to get a lot of adrenaline. So I think we end up doing these quite risky, quite mad looking things to other people. I mean, skydivers are probably the same. Um, people who get in the ring over and over again, probably the same that, you know, that height you get. And I think it, then it just takes longer and longer for you to get that rush and get to that high. And then you end up doing crazy things, going faster, buying faster bikes, cars, doing jumps in cars, all this sort of thing, really. So that's how I think it tends to go, or at least it did for me. Yeah. I know it's it's going to be a little bit, not rich, but for me to say this, because obviously doing boxing and you only have to look, type into Google the amount of people that do die from combat sports or definitely get yeah. serious life-changing injuries concussions um, and stuff there's yeah. so so many and even the long-term ones where you don't see it at the start but then later on in life you see it i mean muhammad ali was a clear example yeah. of that probably from his boxing career of course but you know doing a bit of research earlier like deaths and crashes within motor motor mo mo sports um i think that probably the most famous one was 1994 uh i can't always pronounce his name right is it a, a tons oh, Sen Senna, yeah. yeah that's it 1994 crashed into a wall, yeah. died. Obviously, a very, very successful Brazilian racing car driver. MotoGP, there was one actually in the last few years, a guy called Jason Duspora, um, uh, a, a guy from, I think it's Norway or someone, something like that, died. But then even more recent, a guy called Craig Breen, I think he actually was racing uh, Fiestas. Yeah. Uh, in April 2023, lost, it, lost his life as well. And... Do you ever think about, like, you could crash one day and kill yourself? Yeah, and it's interesting. I, mean, I know Craig and um, funny Chris, who races in my team, um, is currently driving Craig's old car. Um, is a tribute race this weekend. He's in P1 at the minute. So, yeah, I mean, we're always close to that. You sign your waivers before you go on track and everything. But everything's done in a way to make it safe. Um, you know, you've got roll cages, harnesses. It is safe is the strange thing, I think. Um there is risks with anything. I I would say for me, like combat sports or something would be more dangerous to me than what I would do. Because um, you know, you're getting direct head in. But for us to get direct problems would have to be quite, there'd have to be something quite serious go wrong. And I find a lot of the things you find with racing drivers, um, 
I mean, um, Ken Block was one this year who passed away, a famous race car driver. He, he made the amazing Jim Carner series, um, and he unfortunately lost his life this year in a ski do, ski ski mobile accident. Um, and, there, and there's been others, named countless ones. Conor McRae, another famous one, unfortunately crashed a helicopter outside of a race weekend. And then I think it goes back to a, probably what more you get more from racing drivers is because of that adrenaline thing. You go and do a hobby that's not. Uh, so safe in terms of it's not regulated or something like skis helicopters random things and you end up losing your life that way because you take those same risks those same limits to something else it's not quite so constrained in 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 that sort of thing so i don't think of the danger too much with the racing but like anything you do in life isn't it if you want to if you're going to take a bit of risk and have a bit of fun there's always going to be a a downside you know to some some extent um but i always live my life you could walk out here today and something could happen and there you go so as long as you're enjoying it and taking precautions what more can you do absolutely on that note then um i know you mentioned about the accident when you were younger but has there been any near near kind of bad crashes or can you tell us about any crashes or anything that is you 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 can reflect on the race and you thought oh my god that was that was close to the wire I've had a lot of crashes because it sort of comes with racing. This is the one thing I always find super interesting with, um, you know, when you get into road cars, just how normal crashing cars seem, becomes to racing drivers um, and you just rebuild them and stuff. But nothing like crazy. I've broke some bones in my legs and feet and different things, riding motocross, collarbones, um, all sorts of stuff you'd get through motocross racing, really. But touch wood, nothing in, in cars, really just a lot of big crashes. But like I said, you're strapped in so tight and you're held in so tight. There's never really been anything too um, too dramatic. But rollover is always fun. When you end up on your roof, it's never a, a good sign. But you always get back out somehow. <laughs> um, I watched on your YouTube earlier that uh, Santa Pod, is it? Yeah. And you were doing the, the is it the mile or two mile stretch yeah, or something like that? Yeah, the drag race, yeah. The drag race. Yeah, yeah. And there was um, a McLaren, some sort of McLaren, and you raced it in your, your is it um, the BMW Mini? Yes. Um, am I right in saying, quote, quote in what you said, it goes 0 to 60 in like one and a half seconds? Yeah, yeah. So it's a FIA World Rallycross guy. It's a really cool history on that guy. We actually built it ourselves in a workshop in the Forest of Dean from where I'm from. We wanted to enter a series called, uh, series called the FIA World Rallycross, but you need a 600 horsepower all-wheel drive car that meets certain homologation specs. It will go 0-60 in 1.8 seconds-ish, um, quarter of a mile in about nine seconds, which is what we've done at Santa Pod. And we could have uh, bought a car, but my dad is an engineer by trade. He was a car mechanic when he was young, and he had the bright idea, well, let's build a car. Um, so we took it upon ourselves in six months to build a car from scratch. We had to get a mini chassis, take everything off it, um, strip it bare metal, dip the chassis, and then rebuild a whole race car around it. It, it competed at world level, um, you know, against manufacturers and things. So that was a fun, that was probably four or five years ago now. And that car doesn't race anymore because it's all moved electric, but we use it for demo events and different things, a bit of a promotion vehicle with Excite. And yeah, but a lot of fun in that car. I mean, it just completely left that McLaren, which yeah. that McLaren, what must be like 200, two, 250 thousand pound car. Yeah. I, I'm just speculating. And it, and it was, it wasn't even in, in the shot of the, the, the video by the end of it. No, I mean, I felt bad for the guy. He was in there. Obviously he likes drag racing by the looks and he's in there with his laptop tuning it and all this. And then obviously we smoked him and he was like, yeah, no, I fucked something up on the laptop <laughs> and all this. So yeah, I felt a bit bad for him, but no, it's good fun. One, how much would that car, that rally car, be if, if i wanted to buy it today how much would it set me back um if you wanted to buy it with enough stuff to run it probably a million a uh, million quid yeah really yeah yeah they're they're not cheap cars i mean damper is on those cars damper for anyone who doesn't know is a suspension that goes on each corner of the car probably is you're looking at like um 30 40 grand per corner just to get your corners and then your engines probably 180k for a new one fresh is custom made out of billet aluminium block that they mount down and turn into an engine and then you've got all the other bits inside so yeah they're not um cheap cars because it i don't know if you said this earlier but on your youtube you said that that particular car was regulated to 600 brake horsepower but if you were to take it off it's a thousand brake horsepower yeah if, so that we run a air restrictor um it's homologated to a certain size it's just to reduce if you reduce airflow basically there's less spark ignition so you get less horsepower 
but that could be taken out and it's a thousand horsepower. I've never took it out actually. I need to do it just to see what it's like. I've had a few friends that have took the ones out of theirs, but it'd be pretty mental. So, so if you were to do that same drag, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean it's uber quick anyway as it is. But if you were to say take that valve out or yeah. that that washer out and do that stretch how quick would it go to 60 i have no idea to be honest would I it be less than a second a quarter of a mile would definitely be quicker i don't know whether the 0 60 would be hugely quicker because of course you'd get s slip with the tires the limiting factor is a tire contact patch but if we put some big slicks on i reckon yeah it'd be it'd be probably one and a half seconds and yeah probably quarter mile eight eight and a half nine ten seconds and what's that like like when you put your foot down because you know i've been in like porsches lamborghini ferraris and they do it you know between three and four seconds, let's say. Yeah. Remember having a when I when I bought a Pulse Turbo years ago, a nine nine six, and it was a manual, and it was a Pulse Pulse Turbo Silver, and uh, that used to do it four point two seconds. And back in the day, I thought that was so quick, and it is quite quick still. It is quick, yeah. yeah and I remember, but, but to do something like that in one point five seconds is is kind of bonkers. It is bonkers. It it's like a. It is a blur, honestly, because you obviously launch the car, load the car up on the throttle and everything, go. And you'll pull through six gears like, like that. It's like boom, 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 and you're straight at the top speed. So it's, um, yeah, it's a nuts feeling. You do, you get accustomed to it like anything. Um, but it's it's different because people have probably been in Teslas now that are that sort of speed. But it's a different because it's a mechanical, noisy engine and everything. It just feels fast. It's got turbos on it as well, yeah? Yeah, it's got a turbo, yeah, Garrett turbo. Um, it's only a two-litre engine. Okay. producing oh, really? all that power yeah what's the top end speed you can go then not very fast because of course it's geared for the tracks we do and we only need about 120 30 mile an hour on the tracks we do because there's a corner before you do that sort of speed so it's just geared for the track really yeah does it handle well yeah yeah they're amazing because they're designed obviously tarmac and dirt so it can run on both surfaces you compromise a bit then on both obviously to be good on dirt you have to sacrifice um, your time on the tarmac so we balance it at every track we'll change the diffs preloads in the diffs, we'll change suspension. Um, we'll change everything. The only thing that you can't change is the tires. Could you legalize it and put it on the road? Do you know, I've always wondered this because it would be the coolest little demo car ever now. But I don't know if you can put a cage on the road, a full cage, right. if you know what I mean. Because I think if you crashed it into another car, it would cause some problems for the other car. Couldn't you take the cage out, partly? Mm, no, it's always literally built into the chassis. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's but we do use it for events and different things um i've done the car wave drag race in it right it's the m3 in a ferrari so, no that was an svj blitz on there so yeah yeah nice few cars i know we spoke about people like uh, uh colin colin mccray um and yeah the other guy that springs to mind obviously who hasn't lost his life but he's been in a coma for a very long time is, is michael schumacher yeah. and this is again highlighting hobbies and things they do outside That's of racing one. and you would think that they would if they're going to die or, or be injured it's going to be through their profession and it's actually the, these other hobbies um and it's such a sad thing to 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 to, to see it um these t type of names i mean who do you look up to as a racing car driver as an athlete who who is like at the pinnacle and you think yeah that that's the person that gives me the uh, the drive i mean when i was younger Funnily enough, it's the people I now race with, which is really interesting to think I now race with my idols, I guess they were. So one was Travis Pastrana, who was the first guy to do a double backflip on a motocross bike. Um, I haven't raced him on bikes, but he now races in the series I race in, in Nitro Rallycross. He actually started Nitro Circus, which is a huge global entertainment business um, that is now what I race in, Nitro Rallycross. So I get to race with him. And I remember being in my first World Rallycross race, which is the pinnacle of Rallycross sat on the start line at Lydon Hill down in Dover and uh, a guy called Petter Solberg, six, seven times world rally champion, one of the most famous guys. Um, and I'm just sat there and Ken Block was there as well and a few other, Sebastian Loeb, a few of the biggest names in the world at racing. And I'm there probably, what was I, 20, I guess, just coming into my racing gear, career and I'm sat on the start grid, uh, you know, rode up on the start line, the lights are ready to go green and I'm lined up against these guys. I'm like, how the fuck am I sat here right now with some of my idols just side by side and we're just going to go and have it off on track and I'm going to try and beat them. And I had to sort of say to myself, I was like, look, you're human. You've got two feet. You've got two eyeballs and a brain. Same as them. All right, they've got all this experience and this massive, you know, achievements, but you can sit here and race with them. So just do it. And I just had to go in with it with that blind confidence that like, fuck it, you can just do this as long as you just go. Um, but that was a cool experience. 
You mentioned Jensen Button earlier. Um, what's he like as, as an individual? Lovely guy. Typical Bristol Somerset guy. Really down to earth. And yeah, we actually raced against him in a series called Extreme E, which is an off-road electric motorsport. Started by a guy called Alejandro, who was the founder of Formula E. Sold Formula E to Liberty Media. I think he sold it for like eight, nine hundred million. Um, and he started this new off-road series called Extreme E, which I ended up racing against Jensen Button. Did beat him. Sorry, Jensen. Get that in there. Um, and uh, we, we were just having it off at one of the racetracks, just talking. I was like, look, there's this new motorsport coming, done by Travis Pastrana. It's got these tracks on a bit of tarmac, because there's no tarmac in Extreme E, and he's obviously a tarmac racer. Um, and there's jumps, and it's cool, and it's in the US, and that's where his family are. I said, let's just do it together. And literally just the last event at Extreme in Dorset, we were just there talking. I was like, look, if I can get a team sorted in some cars and we can run it professionally, are you keen to come and have a go? And he was like, yeah, get it sorted and, and I'll come. So we ended up as teammates then racing in, in this new Nitro Radicals series, which you know, is pretty cool. I know like racing anything gives you a feel, you know, time in balance, you know, getting used to the speed, etc. But then at the same time, what I'm trying to get to is this. I play squash. Yeah. I also do boxing and if you start doing tennis you can actually mess up your squash because it's it's the same but different you yeah know, you're yeah. hitting a ball still with a racket but you have to hit it differently yeah yeah when you're doing boxing or you can compare it to tire boxing for example the stance is different and it can actually hinder you sometimes 100 percent. so my question is this with jensen button going from formula one and becoming he was world champion at one stage yeah. right coming into the rally sector that you're a part of would that hinder him or does that does that does it actually help his his racing ability no it would yeah i mean i went go-karting with him in la um and i was like all right i'm as quick as him in these dirt cars off-road why can i not be as quick as him in a go-kart this is fine get there fucking eye smokes me i'm talking like 20 seconds of that at the start quicker than me and I, there was no way I was ever going to get anywhere near him. But like you said, I was in his pool and I was in his home. Um, and that is the difference with Rallycross, what I do. It's tarmac, it's dirt, it's jumps. It's like a, all sorts of things. And funny, Dana White's just bought the series. And the reason he bought the series is, is he said it's the MMA of motorsport. It is the mixed martial arts of motorsport. There's tarmac, there's dirt, there's jumps, there's loose. You know, we have everything in Rallycross. So we become this like very multidisciplined driver. Um, some are quicker on tarmac, some are quicker on dirt, but overall we like this MMA type style of, of driver. So yeah, it's very hard for people who are specifically good at tarmac racing to come and do rally crossing and, and vice versa. Um, people do do it, but it takes a lot of time to, to get there. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, I never really kind of, kind of thought about it like that. So um, what about then MotoGP? Mm. So... There's this weekend, isn't it, at Donington, is it? Sorry? Is this weekend at Donington, there is a moto... Is there? I think it is, yeah. Um, uh, before you, you turn up earlier, I used to watch this video quite a lot as a motivational type thing for, for the sales guides. Um, listen to a lot of personal development, listen to a lot of speeches, listen to or watch a lot of videos. And the one I always used to watch, and I've just watched it again today, Valentino uh, Rossi against Lorenzo, the Spanish MotoGP 2009. Yeah, I know the video. And it's about seven minutes long, and there's this one where they've put this, this, this kind of music over the top and there's people commentating, and it's unbelievable, even if you're not into GP, just to see them go at it head to head. And it was the last corner that Rossi opened, Done him on this corner that no one's ever done d- d- done anyone uh, yeah, yeah. on, and he and he won it, and it it's just mental. Like and again, like the adrenaline, and I, I, he's got to be nuts. He's just got to have a little bit of a screw loose because what he pulled off there was 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 bonkers. What is that like? That that type of skill opposed to rallying or Formula One, like racing these motorbikes at that speed. What can you give me a bit of insight to that? Well, I tried to go around Brands Hatch last night on my bike, and the some kids are quick. And again, I think you could just come back to that discipline thing. What are you used to doing to them? It feels so natural, doesn't it? So, you when you go fast in cars on bikes, and you get very, very good at it, um, like towards the elite end, you get into like this flow state, and it's a really weird thing to describe. But I can imagine professional boxers would get it, and people in different professions where like you almost go like GTA bird's eye view out and you're in the car or on the bike 
and you sort of come out of it and you're looking down almost like a hologram and it becomes very like you become very attached to the vehicle you're riding and the car and the bike and you become very detached as like a being it's quite a weird feeling but it feels like flow state i would call it and you'll come off the track and you won't know what you've done and you'll just see the points and he would have definitely been in that state when he was making those moves racing marquez like that he would have been so just at one with what was going on he probably knew when he was going to pass him do you know what i mean and it's such a weird feeling to have um and that's probably why i get quite addicted to racing i love running businesses and doing other things uh, you know with business i find it really hard to get that feeling doing much else but i think gamers get it i've heard talk before in gaming industry if they get in flow state and i can imagine when you're really you know, like in the game it probably is that sort of feeling really yeah 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 definitely um okay so um my, my question i was going to ask you earlier is this um formula one obviously that's probably the the race in that gets the most amount of glory Singapore night race. You've got the Abu Dhabi one, which I've been to. Monaco, I've been to that. Yeah, nice. I mean, it's the money, the fame, the women, the boats, the sun. It's just, it's got it all. Like my miss is not so 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 into, um, you know, r racing. But when we went to Monaco, it's just like the whole atmosphere is just yeah. incredible. Um, did you ever have sights on becoming a Formula One driver? Never for me, no. I think probably the path I chose motocross, it leads you down off-road. Um, and I was never really looking at what could racing do for me. It was a hobby that went into a passion. So I never went, you know, some kids or probably parents of kids are thinking, you know, you need to be in F1, so let's go go-kart and then we'll do F4, F2 um, and work your way up. And it costs a lot of money for them to do that. And they've probably got that ultimate end goal. I never really had an end goal. I just wanted to race and have fun and enjoy it. And that's a sort of how I led myself down this path, really. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it would be nice, but too old now. <laughs> um, you fan of Formula One? Yeah, big fan. What yeah. Drive to Survive had done with that series has been amazing. Because I was similar. I wasn't a big <coughs> Formula One fan. I'd been to a few races, but I didn't watch it religiously. I'd see the results and be like, oh, nice, watch a replay or something. Um, but since Drive to Survive, I feel like you get to know the people, don't you? And the storytelling there was amazing. So Admittedly, I haven't watched it yet. If you're not, to, you no, need, need to watch to. that. It yeah. gives you actually, like, then you understand the people, the drivers, the characters. I'm sure they fabricated some of it, haven't they? But at least you feel like you know what's going on. Whereas before, it was like just different cars racing, isn't it? Like what I do now. Who's the ultimate then? Michael Schumacher or Lewis Hamilton? I mean, I'm the era of Lewis, so I've like seen more of Lewis, you know what I mean? Um, but obviously Michael Schumacher was the greatest driver, I think, in, in probably all time in terms of what he was able to do in a car, especially the cars back then, because they were quite agricultural compared to what they are now in terms of driver aids and things. But I admire Lewis for what he's done from like a driver brand point of view. Nobody's been able to sort of, he is famous in everything, isn't he? In fashion, in music, in whatever he does, his brand sort of exudes it. And I don't think any driver has been able to do that before. So to see a driver become that almost like Beyonce type star in their own profession is quite cool, I think. Mm. A lot of respect for that. Yeah. How fit do you have to be to be a, a racing car driver? I mean, I, I mentioned earlier, I had a little go on, on the track on, on, yeah. on a bike and I, t I challenge anyone to do it. It's so bloody hard. But what's it really like performing at the top being a, being a racing car driver? You have to be fit. You have to be physically fit, I would say, to a point. But I would say you're not like boxing level fit, but you have to be very fit. So I'm like, you have to be able to, I don't know, go on a treadmill for an hour and just keep running, do an hour circuit and be able to do it. That's, that's the probably level of fitness you need, which is probably quite achievable. The difficult bit is you become quite fit for that application. Like I raced motocross for eight years. If I got on a motocross bike now, I could probably do four laps and my arms would be pumped up. I wouldn't be able to hold on and probably fall off and your fingers all cramp up, but you become fit for that thing. Do you know what I mean? Likewise, now in a race car, I'm fit for that. The biggest thing, which is partly where my brand came from is why the idea behind it is the cognitive side of it is quite stressful. So you have, you know, you race say three times a day. Um, there's two error gaps in between. It's usually very hot, very humid. You lose a lot of salts, a lot of body weight. Um, and really it's trying to, how do you keep your mind mentally sharp through those big swings in the day, especially as you're doing something this fatiguing. I mean, I went yesterday on the on the bike, as I said, in the morning I did an error on the stepper. I wear a whoop and it said there was a strain score of eight for an error on a stepper. And you've been on a stepper, the fucking mm. hard work. And that was an error on it. It said like 450 calories or something. Anyway, I went on the bike. I done 
a 20 minute session and it was double that from 20 minutes so that's the type of stress your body is being put under because it's mental it's physical it's everything combined um so yeah it is a stressful environment but cognition is the biggest one because you need quick reactions mm. have you ever been in a formula one car i've been in a formula two car but never a formula one i'd love to fucking drive one now and uh, what was it like being in a formula two car yeah amazing they're yeah. very like they have very high grip at very high speeds that's the hardest bit to get your head around because of course they work on downforce principles which we don't have in rally cross or rally so much but yeah the faster you go the more grip you get which is a weird it's weird concept. weird to, concept to get your head around because it's the opposite of what you, you think and feel. I think I remember on uh, Top Gear, I think Richard Hammond was 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 trying to... Uh, that take, was it, yeah. And take, he couldn't get quick enough to get the tyre attempts, could that's he? That's it. He was yeah. going through like different Formula cars, Ford yeah. and all these different cars to try and get to a Formula 1 car to do yeah. just one lap. Yeah, and he couldn't get the speed. <laughs> yeah, I think he managed to do it in the end, Did didn't he? he? Yeah. He right, probably put yeah. some wet tyres on yeah. it, right? And they were saying, you need to go fast around the corner for it to be safer. Because yeah. if you're not going fast, there's no downforce and therefore you spin out. Yeah. And that must be such a weird paradox almost. It's like, you know, your body's saying, I don't want to do this. But yeah. scientifically, you have to do it because yeah, without yeah. it, you're going to spin out. That, that must be a hard thing to get your head around. We have a similar one. The, in in rally cross the track i just went to oklahoma there was a 140 foot step up jump so you come in you come down this big bowl and then hit the bottom and then you go up and you're going up for probably 150 meters then you take off problem is if you do not take off fast enough you don't make it to the other end and then you can land on the hump and break your back and different things um one guy unfortunately I think he's all right now but he had to be taken away because he didn't make it and broke his back or hurt his back so that is that same feeling where you're coming at you come first lap you come around this corner and there is no maybes like you either fucking hit this flat out or you just you're i don't know what would happen really and that's quite a weird thing to be coming up first lap just coming down into the bowl the g-force is going you're getting hunkered down in the car you know i just got to keep this flat now and you're going up the takeoff it just looks like it's going to the sky that is probably that same feeling but you just do it you have to it's like it, it literally epitomizes that saying trust the process yeah it is trust the process exactly that oh it's just but it's because like, the outcome's worse <laughs> yeah trust the process but jesus the adrenaline the the, the nerves the anxiety the but fear it's that, and it's that like over it's that accomplishment as soon as you land that jump and i would say the same in those Formula one cars as soon as you just hit it flat and you get around the corner you know ah oh, that was nice and then you just do it every lap then <laughs> yeah um Last thing on kind of Formula One, your your take on Formula One now. Has Formula One been slightly ruined because of the engines have become a lot more economical and friendly? What I'm trying to say is they've gone from this wonderful V10 or V12, yeah, yeah. V10, even the V8. I was at Monaco for the last year. It was v, V8 and the sound was deafening but it was it was what formula one was all about yeah and don't get me wrong they sound they still sound good today but nowhere near what they were do you think it's slightly been ruined ruins probably too strong i think it's changed hasn't it and i race in electric motorsport and the car i raced before sounded absolutely insane that mini like snap crackles pop this it makes all the noises and then I've gone to something that's completely silent. And I was like, fucking hell, how is this going to feel? And how are the fans going to feel? And they're, they're, there is a difference, but they make new noises. They make new sounds. And a lot of this is theatre, isn't it? It's putting on a show. Formula One is a show, ultimately. And I think the people organising the show, um, they get that. And they'll construct things to just get around your senses. Noise, one of them. I'm sure they'll play louder music and have flashing lights and fireworks in the future when it's all electric. But... It is a shame. I do miss, I think our generation will miss that era. Kids growing up, I don't think they care. They see electric cars and they want to play with the iPad in it um, and all the technology. I think we're moving away from knowing that, if you know what I mean, mm. through the generations. I um, I interviewed a guy called Shmi. Yeah, I know Shmi. Tim, 150, yeah. yeah. I went to his sh sh Shmi museum, museum. museum after yeah. the Gumball Rally. There I was a fridge him. of these in there. Yes. Did I give you one? Yeah, you yeah, yeah I have one. Yeah, yeah. That, I thought I recognised yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, he's got a fridge there with some treats. Yeah, and uh, my question to him was, um, 
you know, obviously he's a car influencer, got millions of people that subscribe or follow him and he does very, very well. And the amount of knowledge that guy's got, I mean, he must have four brains. Yeah, like, literally, yeah. he's, he's got a wealth of knowledge there. Very good at what he does and really, really nice guy. But I said, isn't your channel under a little bit of risk because all these people following you are basically petrol heads and they like to, the, the sound of the center that you've got or the Ford GT or your S STO hur yeah, Hurricane Lamborghini. You know, they want to hear all that sound. But as, as things move on, we might start losing that. And he, he obviously had, a, had an answer to it. Do you, do you think, you know, things like that could be under risk? Yeah, it's an interesting one, really. Like you said, I think what I found in the electric motors, what we do, that it definitely alienates the original fans. And you have to build a new audience. And that is tricky. Dana White's just bought the series and he's he's put a lot of money into it to try and do that. And that's why we, we have massive crazy jumps. We didn't used to have massive crazy jumps, but when the cars go silent, what do you do? You put in huge massive jumps because it gets exciting again. So yeah, the, I don't know how, what was his answer with that really? Because he's going to have to get a new audience involved somehow, but how you yeah. quite do that, I don't know. It seems, it seems like expensive and hard. But For memory, he's just saying that it's going to be a very, very, very long time, probably not even in our lifetime, where it's going to be all completely fa fa phased out. I mean, if you look at... I guess performance cars like his, there'll still be an element of petrol around it, but... There still will be a and massive... synthetic fuels, yeah, things like that. Yeah, you know, massive, massive audience who, who will just be... dead. So they might not be making them anymore, but people still own them. Yeah, of course. But I'm guessing in... 200 years time I'm guessing I, I don't know where the world's going to be no, you know no. it's, it's going to be well it's going to be autonomous driving I, don't, I honestly don't think you know, like real young generations coming through will care about cars because I don't think they'll have them and, you know I think we'll be autonomously taking around to where we need to be and owning your own car will be less of a thing I think it, it was huge wasn't it because in the you know sort of or mid middle 90s through from when Henry Ford made the car it was seen as a route to personal freedom you bought your car you could take your family wherever and you had personal freedom and mobility I think that's gone now hasn't it we can get the tube the train mm. autonomous I think you'll order an Uber and a bubble will pop out and you'll get in the bubble and it'll take you somewhere I don't mm. think you'll need a car mm. so it's going to change for new generations there is something about like if you've got a nice car and especially a sports car you know, the Lambo, Ferraris, yeah. Porsches or whatever. It's a way of expressing yourself a bit there as well. There is that an identity thing, yeah. And there's nothing like on the weekend and it's a nice crisp day and the roads are empty and you just go out there and just, you know, just, just have a little blast for, for even work. an hour or so. Yeah. You, there, there is that, it does, I don't know what the word is. It's like... It's freedom, isn't it? I yeah, guess. like you're really expressing yourself and it, and it stimulates you. Mm. You know, really does give yeah, you a feel yeah. good factor. We done the, when we done the Gumbra Rally last year, we, we took a, an Aventador all the way down from Toronto down to Miami. And every single morning, even if you only had an hour of sleep, sometimes... You're still keen to get up and go, you, yeah. You, you get in it for the first time you start it, and you're like, a V12 comes on, and you put your foot down, and when it really opens up, you're like, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just amazing. It's it theatre on wheels, isn't it? It's yeah. like the best drug ever. Yeah, yeah. It really is. Like, there's nothing that can compare to it, and I just, I could never, ever get sick of it. No. It's great. Really, no, really I'm, the same. I'm the same. On that note, what is your um, what's your favourite car brand and what's your favourite car? I've recently really got into Porsches. I got a Porsche 911 GT3 that I'm in love with, and I was the guy in my twenties. I'm just turned thirty. I was like Porsches, they will look the same. I don't really get it, and maybe it's an age thing because I'm starting to realise I'm liking things that older people used to like. <laughs> But I just love Porsche at the minute. The craftsmanship of them, their German engineer, and it just does what it says. On track, it's an absolute weapon. I think now they look really cool, whereas I didn't really think they looked that cool. But the more modern ones have changed a bit, I think. Um, it'd be that or Ferrari for me. Have you taken like Porsches and Ferraris and things like that around tracks and, yeah. and really had a go? Yeah, going? I have. Yeah, yeah. And for me, Porsche is by far yeah. the nicest one to do a track type thing with. Most reliable as well, right? Yeah, I would say so. And they're the one that lets you take it on track and do stuff. I had a Merc C63 um, that I did take on the track, I can admit now, but it did blow up. But it didn't blow up on the track. It blew up on the way home from the track. Right. But, oh, the stick I got from Mercedes for that, because, of course, it was like, they actually went on my Instagram and found a photo of me on track. It was like, well, you shouldn't have been on the track. And I was like, well, you've sold me a performance car, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Of so don't do that. We're talking about your businesses then. So we've got Excite. 
Yeah. Um, you mentioned about SME. So do you do you do a bit of business with this particular brand with a lot of the influencers or is it just Tim SME that you, you, you're no, connected we, with? No, we do, yeah. I mean, um, Tim, I just connected with him. We just got on well and I said, I'll send you a fridge, keep it in the background, you can have some cans and all and he, he liked the brand and the product. So that was just a relationship thing. But yeah, we do things with influencers. Um, not so much in the automotive industry anymore. We're focused heavily on the creative market, entrepreneurs, that type of thing, because our drink has cognitive-based amino acids, nootropics, which is set to be probably one of the biggest drivers of the energy drink category in the future. So we focus it heavily in that sector now in terms of our marketing, but yeah, I give it to whoever wants to try it, really. Why did you decide to come up with this brand and what was the kind of vision behind it then? It was, again, I was, I'd done a health and nutrition degree when I was younger, getting in, you know, when um, it was that craze where everyone was going to the gym, not to the pub? I was in that sort of era. Um, and I was like, right, I'm drinking all these shit drinks. I can't Red, read what's Red in Bull. it. All the usual ones, yeah. Can't read the ingredients. Half of it sounds like chemistry. What am I actually drinking here? But I did like the whole fizzy, tasty caffeine thing. I wasn't a big coffee drinker. So I was like, I want to race cars. And I want a drink that is got mental stimulation, good for performance, but tastes good. And it's got none of the shit, basically. I was like, can I stick these two together? So I need a killer brand. So obviously it needs to look cool as fuck to go against some of these global brands. I need a product that really does deliver on those things. And then if I can combine them, surely I can sell enough cans that I can go racing. Of course, immaturity is probably the biggest driver of innovation, I think. And I as was so immature in terms of I didn't immature in experience. I didn't know the market or how drinks work. So it's been a really big uphill battle to get this into the market, to do the branding, to do the formulations for the beverages. But we're there now and we're solidified. We're in the market and growing really fast, which is exciting. But that's how I thought naively back then. I package it all together, I guess. What's the, um, if I can ask, how successful is the brand now then? Yeah, what? really. I mean, we've been going four years now. The first two years, we really learned we've had three brand changes we've had two formulation changes like a lot of probably innovators and entrepreneurs and startups we really sort of sort of changed as we moved there was no big agencies involved there no was no big plan in strategy it was like this is what we want this is what it should look like put it into market and test it okay well that worked that didn't re you know re redo some of those things and keep moving forward till we are where we are now which i think is is a ready to go global brand in in um uh, product we got different products as well that i can come on to but yeah i think we're in the place now where we're going to do that we're in a few thousand stores across the uk now most of the petrol stations you'll find us in um we've just got a deal through last week with a big distributor um it's going to put us into up to ten thousand convenience stores across the uk which is really exciting and then we've just launched in the us which is a huge market for us i mean the us is is insane we can probably do a business like us doing 10 15 million rev in the uk would be very good that would be a decent market share in the uk you could probably do that in la alone in the us it's that kind of size so we don't need a lot of business in the us to to make this a billion dollar business which is quite the exciting thing and our drinking brand seems to really take on uh, you know take off in the us i think it's because nootropics are understood cognition is a bit more understood they're always three years ahead in the us that's the difference mm. um so it's, it feels like right time right place for us at the minute so you're the founder yeah and and you've got business partners yes yeah, so i've got a co-founder actually megan um she's my fiance of let's get this right it's 11 or 12 years i always get this wrong um <laughs> so yeah she's my fiance but we started this business together i actually came to her with I guess the idea in terms of this is what I would like, Meg, what do you think? She was in health and fitness as well. And she's like, no, I, I can actually see an opportunity for this. And she's got a very keen eye for branding. Um, she's been great with the formulations and stuff. She's involved on the MPD side of things. And for, it was so important for me, I think, having her just to like bounce ideas back and forth. That's what I found from me and her as co-founders. Like she would like say no to some of my ideas that I would have probably ran with and just give me time to thought, think and reflect, I think. Um, and yeah, we're still still going to this day. It's such a, I mean, I, I've got a business partner and um, it's so important to have people around you that will say no. Yeah. If you have a bunch of yes, yes people, even though that might f make you feel good short term, in actual fact, it's not it's not no, right no. for business. It's it's good for your ego, but it's not right for business. And I've had this in, in the business. Um, you know, I've had staff say things to me 
Like, yeah, that idea is great, for example, let's call it an idea. Yeah, that idea is great, but I know for sure why they've said to someone else in the business that I just really didn't like that idea. I'm like, well, you could have just told me, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I think there's a fear factor, obviously, and you don't want to say things to your, to your boss, and um, maybe I need to work on culture so they feel comfortable <laughs> to tell me. But yeah, that's the great thing with having co-founders and founders and business partners to bounce those ideas. And you probably know with, with your own business, you can sit in your head a lot as an entrepreneur and founder. And you can get caught up in your own head with ideas and getting stuck on things. And I think having someone to bounce off is, is important. So Excite, you believe it's going to be a billion dollar brand. That's the aim for us, yeah. We're gonna be we wanna own the nootropics space. So nootropic is a Greek word for mind turning. It's ingredients that help with cognition is the really basic principle of it. And it's quite niche and small in the uk at the minute but in the us it's already quite prominent um you've got brands over there that are already doing billion dollars of revenue in this market it's set to be 23 billion in 2025 just alone this category and i think the energy category will move this way um since we were the first ever new tropic energy drink since we launched four years ago four or five others have entered the market already trying to catch up so i think we're the right brand in the right position to take that space can I ask, units you shift a year, turnover? Yeah, we shift a couple of million units a year. Turnover is changing every month in terms of what it's getting to, but we'll do two, three million this year in the UK um, with a little bit of export, a little bit of D2C, which is quite good in the UK. It's enough to keep the business stable. Um, it helps us mature. Our growth rate is 500% a year in the UK at the moment, which is um, you know nice. Uh, and yeah, the US really... It's wild. I mean, I think one of our first retailer orders coming through now could do a million quid in the first order type thing. So the scale out there gets crazy quite quick. But of course, that comes with complexities of production, supply chain, marketing. How do people picking up the can know what that drink is? So yeah, it, it comes with complexities, I guess. Would the ambitions be to either sell or float the company? It's, I get asked this a lot with this type of business. And my answer is always the same of, I would sell distribution, but keep the brand. Because for me, I think the brand is the real true value. The brand in the sort of ingredients is what the value is. The difficulty with distribution for a new brand like us is you put wheels on trucks and try and ship a drink across the US. It costs absolute fortunes. So tend to what tends to what happen in this industry is you innovate, you get enough distribution proof of concept that right, if I put it in a decent distribution size, let's say 5,000 stores in the UK, People go in there and purchase it on a good sale rate. So on a, on a weekly basis, it sells a decent amount compared to the competitors. You will get the Pepsis, the Cokes, the Britvics um, looking at you and being like, right, well, our team can't innovate because all we know is how to do Dr. Pepper and Diet Coke. But if we take this brand and put it in our distribution services and put that across the world, then, you know, we're onto a winner. So that's ultimately where I want this business to end up at is, you know, someone with the horsepower to really distribute it, um, which we're already doing something on that side in the UK already, um, which is really exciting. And then the US, again, we'll have to do the same. We'll have to prove that we can do it over there, prove that the brand's successful and people want it. And then you can look to try and, uh, you know, get a distributor to purchase that part of the business really and get it out there. I mean, look, you, 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 you speak so well about the brand. I believe in the brand because I believe in what you're saying because you've got so much conviction in it. It's clear to see that you're passionate about it and, and you know your stuff. But I know, and we all know as founders and people that are in business, that business is not straightforward. Four years this has been in the making. You said this is, this is bit evolved, adapted, oscillated into different kind of, um, you know, uh, di different kind of, images or brands over the yeah. years what has been some of the the, the pitfalls and, and the learning curves and the setbacks that you've gone through trying to develop this brand we've gone through a lot really and i, I always think like it's weird because when we launched in the us now we've got to where we are in the uk in like a month but it's because we already knew all of the mistakes and i always thought like could i've got through those quicker but I don't know if I could, and I don't know if it's just, that is just a part of process, of pest, especially in a business where you're trying to innovate. Um, and I think the difficulty, I mean, I hired a guy, guys who'd been there and done it. I hired number three from Monster um, who'd been there and done it in the UK. The problem was, that I soon realized, is they came to the UK market with a successful US business. He had a checkbook of 30 million quid and a load of cans and was told, there's 30 million quid, there's a load of cans, make it happen. So of course his advice, advice to us 
was quite similar to what they had done, but I didn't have 30 million quid. I needed to bootstrap and make money and then spend it and vice versa. So could we have done it quicker? I don't know. And I don't know if we'd be where we are without making those mistakes, if that makes sense. I think it could be a part of business, especially when you're in a new market and innovating new. But the only thing, it, would I have, and I've seen people who have gone into the corporate world, worked for Coca-Cola's, Britvix and different things, then left and done their own business, and they probably moved quicker than we did because they knew fundamentally all the structures behind those businesses and how it works. That's probably what I could have done with, but um, I was too busy racing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I was going to come on to this last. So you've got your business here. Yeah. You've got racing. You mentioned you've got a girlfriend. Yeah. Partner. Yeah. Kids? No. No kids yet at Two the moment. Two dogs, which are flipping worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, your social life. And then I'm led to believe that you you do a bit of property as well. Yes. So developments, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which you said said uh, said off off air. Yeah. How do you how do you balance and juggle and spin all these plates? How how, how do you even cope? I do uh, like, I think I inadvertently run my life quite eighty twenty. It's the Pareto rule, you know, where like twenty percent leads to eighty percent of the outcome, twenty percent of the input. And I think I probably do that, like inadvertently do that. So. Um, you know, I will get all the emails done for Excite today that really do need to be done to move the dial. And I'll do that for all my businesses and then I'll go race a bike in the evening and then I get home late and spend an hour with my girlfriend. And I will just use every hour of, of the day to move myself forward, really. And I, I've almost got that, I don't think it's ADHD, but I've got something where I just, I cannot sit still. If whatever time I have in the day is used to move forward, whether it's moving this forward or my motorbike passion or my racing career i won't just sit still i'll be doing something I won't just, even if i watch youtube it'll be how to flip and lean a bike over or how to sell a drink do you know what i mean it'll mm. be something so and the, the property stuff that you do like is that is that been run, running alongside everything else that you do or is it more of a new venture no so i was involved in a renewables business at a university um it was a startup business that was called b green energy and we installed ground mount solar across the uk I was MD for that business and involved in that business, um, which was a lot of fun, but the government killed the tariffs, which is what they paid energy providers a subsidy to basically provide clean electricity. That stopped um, and the business sort of stopped with it. I then got involved in a little bit of property with some of the earnings from that business, um, greenfield sites that you try and get planning on in different things. That business sort of just slowly ticks over um, is a sort of investment type business. And then uh, we're involved in a, a new business now, um, where I'm sort of the main investor shareholder of a business called NEP, which is New Energy Partners. So we are going to be installing shortly big battery storage across the UK, um, you know, sort of container sized batteries that will store electricity and feed it to and from the grid. And you'll, you get paid a, a margin in between really to do that for the grid provider, which National Grid supply all the electric. So they're some of the bigger businesses I'm involved in. They're the ones that provide the lifestyle and, and let me do the things I enjoy to do this one is more the like this is the passion brand that i want to take global um which is probably a thorn in the side really but we'll get there <laughs> and you've uh, launched your own podcast yeah yeah i have core fuel for founders um similar to you really i wanted to talk to you know you know as you're networking as an entrepreneur i wanted to talk to people who'd been there and done it but not just been there and done that people that were starting businesses so the whole idea of fuel for founders is we get people who are starting a business interview them see what makes them tick why do they do it and hopefully it's only star money 20 episodes didn't know but hopefully in the future i'll get them back on you know, all right so how did it go what did you learn is your business still going or was it a huge success and yeah hopefully get some cool stories out of it but again that's a, a passion thing for me it ties in nicely with the brand obviously because we're full creators and entrepreneurs so they get some excite when they come on the podcast anyway but yeah i, I enjoy it more than anything because i think we got connected after i interviewed james exon yeah and, yeah and I, i'm guessing you you guys have done some some collaborations together i just got friendly with james um so we worked with tom his brother, brother. yeah, yeah no. on uh promotional activity when we launched in some garages tom went um drove to one of the garages and got the drink and we done a little promo activity for us then I got talking to James and we hit it off on bikes. We went on some bike rides and just got friendly, really. Um, and then, yeah, I saw he came on your podcast. I thought I hit you up. That looked pretty cool. So, yeah, he's a, he's a cool guy. I was texting this morning about liveries for bikes and all sorts of random things. But, yeah, yeah, yeah he's yeah. a fun guy. He's a great guy. Switched on and uh, 
loves the gym a bit, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, he keeps like, he keeps being like, oh, I've got no time to come on the bike. He really wants a bike. He really wants to come out on it. I oh, mean, you're fucking in the gym all the time. Of course, you've got no time. <laughs> well, yeah, he's, 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 he looks he's, good for he's, it. He's, he's doing very, very well in in all aspects. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, Oliver, I, I really, really appreciate your time here today. Um, I normally ask my podcast guest this closing question. You've probably heard it on some other podcasts. My mantra, mantra is this, be happy, never content. I've got my own interpretation of it. What does be happy, never content mean to you? Just keep poking life. I'm a big believer if you keep poking, things come out the other side. So I would just say whatever you want to do in life, wherever you want to be, just keep poking life and things will come back at you. Hopefully positive as long as you do positive pokes. <laughs> I've never heard of uh, the answer or the description about poking life, but I guess you are right. You have to you have to poke it sometimes. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Just keep pushing. <laughs> right. I really appreciate your time, no, mate. Thank, thank, you, thank you, you very much. If the subscribers uh, have enjoyed it, please share it with friends and family, and remember to be happy, never content. Thank you once again. No, thank Cheers, you, mate. mate. No, enjoyed it. Cool. No, it was great. Top man. No, thank you. <laughs>